On today's show, we're exploring the short documentary series, Taste, that takes you on a journey of people who make food around the world with Kevin Longa. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Hi, Tammy. It's great to see you. So I want to know what your journey was into filmmaking to then traveling the world to shoot chefs. <laughs> uh, well, it's certainly been a long journey. Um, I've been making films ever since I was eight years old. I made everything from like stop motion Lego movies to comedies, karate movies, dramas, skate videos, music videos, sock puppet movies, you name it. Um, but uh, I was also fairly overweight when I was a kid. I'm a mixed race guy and uh, a lot of my family, uh, well, I mean, this is the story of America, were immigrants from somewhere and uh, they had to assimilate and... Um, so, you know, my normal meals at McDonald's would be like large fries, large Coke, McFlurry, uh, cheeseburger, uh, two McChickens. I would have like a uh, half a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts in one sitting. It was, <laughs> it was pretty gross, actually, now that I think about it. And just after a long time of being picked last for kickball and um, seeing my cousins and my grandparents giving themselves insulin shots and blood sugar tests and things like that as diabetics. I just kind of started realizing some things. And then finally I was in the doctor's office and my nurse, she came walking in with my body mass index chart. And uh, she kind of looked over the brim of her glasses and gave me a piercing glare and said, Kevin, if you keep this up, you're going to have type two diabetes. And I just froze and I had this epiphany moment. And then um, after that, I got home looked into my mirror in my uh, bedroom and I took off my shirt and I grabbed my love, love handles and I just wished that I could easily take off that fat as easy as I could take off like a, you know, heavy camera strap from around my neck. Literally the day after that, I started exploring my food through the best way I knew how, which was through my video camera. And so uh, luckily, luckily enough, I was, um, you know, living in the Bay area. That's where I grew up most of my life. And, uh, you know, I was able to film with people who were pioneering like the organic and regenerative farm movements. I was, uh, you know, hitting local restaurants and farms and farmers markets, interviewing people who make food. And so by the time I was in high school, I made my first uh, feature length food documentary. And so this has kind of been like a lifelong pursuit. There's a lot more that gets into like what I'm doing now with taste and, and all the countries and all the people who I filmed in food. Um, that's the beginnings. Well, you got to start somewhere. And what was the camera that you were using back then? And are you still using the same camera? It was my dad's hi eight handy cam uh, um, at the very beginning, like when I was eight years old. But then I graduated to some mini DV cameras. Like I had uh, a Sony HDR FX1, which was my pride and joy. That's what I used to film my uh, food documentary uh, back in high school on. Uh, I also had a really great friend who lived up the block from me. Uh, we made lots of films together, and he had his own uh, mini DV camera as well. And then eventually, with Taste, when I first started that, it was in 2013, it was the DSLR revolution. And so I um, used a Canon 5D. And GoPros, right? And GoPros, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your feature called? And where can people see it or... It's called Fueling America, and you cannot see it anywhere because I use a lot of copyrighted music. And uh, I don't know. I've, I've, I mean, when you're in high school, you're just putzing around, just trying different things and stuff like that. And, you know, I had no mind of like film festivals or anything like that. Now that I'm kind of like more aware of the landscape of the film industry, uh, I'm actually kind of bummed that I didn't because uh, I actually did win a few film awards when I was a kid, but they were for like other little shorts and things like that. I had no idea that like you could, as a high schooler, submit a, a film, uh, a documentary feature uh, at a film festival, but maybe I should have. Well, I mean, look at where you're going. You know, there's more time to have more films and stuff. Uh, and, and also, you know, we learn a lot from the first film to, you know, as we've been doing this for years, uh, things that we would do differently. So um, it's always good to create something new. And on the documentary of taste, how many episodes have you done so far? 
So I've shot 70 short films. Okay. I edited about half of them. Okay. And part of the reason why I came to New York was actually to build out a team. Uh, I've been kind of like a one-man film team for the most part. Uh, and so looking to hire some editors, a DP, a business development um, person in particular, help build out the commercial side of taste. And so, yeah, that's uh, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, and I had seen one of your short films that I believe is on YouTube, kind of your journey to figuring out this is what you wanted to do. Do you want to just take us through how did you get the idea for taste and then to decide to travel the world to do this? Well, uh, it certainly has been a, a lifelong formation. And I, this is something I'm going to be continuing to do for the rest of my life. Uh, there, there's just no question in my mind. And a lot of times people ask me, like, have you ever thought about giving up or something like that? Frankly, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's I've certainly seen my fair share of rejections and dead ends and failures and I've been nearly killed twice while doing this, but like, I don't know, like what else am I going to do with my life? Like, and me and a few guys, uh, and girls, women, um, we started the film and photography society back at UCLA, which was this kind of like ragtag team of multidisciplinary majors who just wanted to make films. One of our leaders, uh, he basically wants to be like the next Michael Bay and, we basically created these, um, let's just say like big budget student films. And we we just really utilized UCLA's resources, everything from our, we have a SWAT team, we have ROTC, we have our fire department, we have all these uh, resources, including, you know, the student card. <laughs> we can play that. So we made like movies with helicopters, explosions, uh, chase scenes. We shut down the LA river like they did in Terminator 2. And so, yeah, we really learned how to make films on a shoestring budget. And, uh, by the time I graduated, uh, it was the tail end of the economic recession. Not a lot of people were hiring. And I, um, as an economics major, there's basically three career paths that you get fed into investment banking, accounting, or consulting. I rather like there the crooks on Wall Street started this whole financial crisis, so I wouldn't want to go into investment banking. Uh, I'd rather stick a number, do pencil on my butt, than do debits and credits for the rest of my life with that pencil. And uh, consulting sounded interesting, and I come I somewhat pursued it. And there was like this uh, one role at Google that um, sounded somewhat similar to the consulting path, and I got to like the you know the final rounds of interviews, but I eventually, I eventually got hit with that whole, like, you need experience in order to get experience, uh, catch 22 conundrum. You know, I was kind of going through my whole Dustin Hoffman in, in the graduate kind of, uh, phase. And, uh, my friend, Brian, who, uh, co-founded the film and Ver photography society with me, um, back in college, he gave me a call out of the blue and says, Hey, we just got invited to a big film festival in Asia. Do you want to come? And I was like, I don't know, man. I gotta find a job. He was like, What is it you actually want to do? What is what? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? And so I thought back to my time in high school, and I thought back to I didn't mention this, but in college I studied abroad in Europe. I studied in Denmark, which was the culinary capital of the world at the time. I saved up eating cheese and crackers for months to go to Noma, one of the best restaurants in the world. And I, I kind of followed Rene Redzepi's philosophies around food. And then I backpacked all around Europe, experiencing food and, and learning about the chefs who made the food and the farmers and the people who made the food. And so I said to him, okay, I got back on the phone with him and I was like, all right, I'll go with you, but on one condition, I want to take your camera that's the Canon 5D I mentioned. Um, and I want to film what I love, which is the people who make our food. And so uh, literally the day after that, I open up my laptop. On the left side of my screen is my flight ticket to Asia. On the right side is my bank account. I hit submit over here and about five minutes later, <laughs> the other side. And so I was committed. Um, but 
I do not regret it for one second because I knew this kind of intuitively, but the, the reason why I make taste is because I believe that nothing unites us more than food and stories. Like I've been fortunate enough to film people who do such amazing things with food. Uh, and I'm not just talking chefs. I'm talking about snail farmers, cricket farmers, hunters in Borneo, former felons who become cooks and uh, dictator fighting restaurateurs in Myanmar, cake makers who fight anti-Semitism in Budapest. And so I think everyone can understand the meaning of food. And food is more than just sustenance. It's more than just calories. It's culture, it's war, it's peace, it's family, it's feasts, it's the environment, it's social justice. It's nothing is more political than food, in my opinion. Who has it, who doesn't, who has access to it, what kind of uh, quality ingredients do people have? And I'm a, I'm a byproduct of, of, the, of that uh, story in a way with my mixed race background and my health struggles. And, but I'm, I'm not alone. I think everyone struggles and, and delights in the stories of food. And so um, that's why I do it. And especially now, because this world is so divided, I, I think we're reaching a tipping point and people are trying to find some kind of common connection. There's something about authenticity of your food and the ingredients that permeates beyond just the food itself and into people. I mean, you are what you eat and into stories and to culture and to who we are as a society. Yeah. And you have a variety. It's never ending the stories. That's the cool part is like you've picked, well, one to do food and then to travel all over the world. There will always be millions of stories you can tell. What is your process for filming the episodes? I mean, do you like ahead of time go, okay, I'm talking to this person, I'm going to go and travel? Or do you just go, okay, I'm going to travel there and I'm going to find the person? Like, what's your process? I wish it was that cool, easy and cool uh, where I was just traveling and then I happened upon a, a chef or a farmer or something like that. No, no, it takes a lot of research uh, to and prep work. Um, because basically when I'm on the ground filming with somebody, I more or less know everything about them. Like I've done pre-interviews with them, uh, over Skype, WhatsApp, Viber, uh, FaceTime, what have you. Um, and I'm ready to rock and roll with them once I hit the ground, uh, in their country. And what I'll do is I'll do it in blocks. So like I filmed my first season taste with Europe all in one go all in a number of months and I just set up like locations and places and like I said I I was in Europe like backpacking around Europe when I was studying abroad in Denmark uh, during college so that was more or less my pre-production like I was going out and I was meeting with people chefs and bakers and what have you and um, I was kind of learning about their stories and so when I went back Later on, I kind of had a good sense of uh, some people who I could film with. And if I didn't know of somebody in that particular location that I was going to, who I would film with, I at least knew people on the ground who might. And the same goes for when I was in Asia with my friend Brian 10 years ago. I, I kind of didn't know what I was doing. I was kind of, but I was getting like beautiful B-roll kind of stuff on, on his 5D and everything. But I would like get that footage of the chef cooking and everything. But then when I finally got the food, I would, you know, put my camera down and I would talk with the chef and learn about their story. For example, the first night that we were in Cambodia, my Brian's bucket list item was to go shoot a bazooka in the middle of the dark night jungle. That was his idea of a fun time. <laughs> and I feared for my life. <laughs> But that's that's a different story. But then after that, we went to a restaurant. My bucket list item was to eat insects, which was, was very much part of uh, Cambodian cuisine. Uh, and I learned from the chef that the tarantula, the chili tarantula that's on their menu is actually something that he had to learn out of necessity to cook 
during the Khmer Rouge, the, the big genocide in Cambodia last century. And now with his restaurant, he's training young kids who, you know, are facing, you know, just in incredible adversity from like uh, HIV, AIDS, uh, sex trafficked kids, street children. And he's basically taking them in as one of his own. And one of the first recipes that he teaches them is that tarantula recipe. And what's also quite interesting is that because of the genocide, there was a big like severance or, uh, you know, the, their culture was almost cut off, like their cuisine. And so they're kind of rebuilding the Khmer cuisine from scratch. Uh, and it starts with that tarantula recipe. So learning those stories as I'm going along helps pre-production for the, the next time I come out to Asia or wherever I'm going to then do a more deep in, in depth filming, uh, short film with them. Yeah. And with the tarantula story, it makes me think, wow, there's a job for everybody. There's somebody who's a tarantula wrangler and gets them and sells them. I mean, like I wouldn't have even thought about that. I mean, I know they yeah. eat that. I just, uh, have, so what would, what did it taste like? Was it good? Or do you just, is it just something out of necessity, you know, like, well, if you have nothing else to eat, that would be the thing. It certainly was a cuisine born out of necessity. Uh, before the Khmer Rouge, it was not really part of their cuisine as much. They did have some insects, or so I've been told, um, but it really became about because of the, the genocide and how there was just so much starvation. Um, and how does it taste? It's more texture than flavor. Kind of like biting into all, I think all insects, it's like biting into a hollow peanut shell. And so, yeah, it's kind of like a kind of a, a crunchy, biting exoskeleton, uh, kind of like makes a little incisions into your, it, it doesn't sound appetizing, I know, but it, like it makes little incisions into your, your tongue, but then those like small little incisions infuse your taste buds with whatever the the insect was cooked in. So this chili, uh, like sweet yet uh, spicy tarantula, kind of has this like numbing yet bright taste because of it. So it cuts into the taste buds and it infuses this lime, lemon, kind of zesty. Um, aftertaste uh after you stole oil <laughs> is there any insects that you ate that you're like wow this is pretty good uh i love crickets in an omelet the thai so i filmed with a thai cricket farmer in like rural thailand and every morning i would have uh cricket omelets so it'd be eggs like just regular egg omelet with with crickets and i think insects are kind of like in a way, tofu, I mean, texture wise, they're polar opposites, but like tofu will kind of like take on the flavor of whatever you cook it in. It's the same with insects. And of course, a lot of people, and this is not new news or anything like that, a lot of insects producers are using it for feed, uh, for like livestock and for like protein meal and stuff like that for baking. And so it's more than just the body itself you know, ingesting that. And also uh, this is something that I, I, I would be remiss to, to mention, but like we're a big population uh, of billions and billions of people and we do need uh, some kind of protein source. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of our protein sources aren't the most sustainable and uh, pound for pound crickets and insects are much more uh, like lead, need less feed, need less water than most other animals do, livestock do. Uh -huh. uh, when you're filming and you're going and doing a series, uh, like a, a season, and you pick a country to go to and you've uh, scheduled it all out, how long are you typically gone for to get all the shows you've scheduled? Um, a number of months I'm normally gone. So, uh, in Europe, I was gone for four to five months and then Asia was six months. Wow. So where are you, like, do you have to, you know, I guess what's funding? How do you fund your film? Do you just save up and you go? Do you have sponsors? Like what, how do you 
what's your budget to do this or do you stay with people? I stay with people. Believe, believe it or not, it's actually quite inexpensive to do this. I mean, especially in some of the locations that I've been in. The biggest financial risk that I've taken is moving to New York City. I mean, if going to Southeast Asia, you can live like a, you can eat like a king for less than a dollar a day. It's just a matter of going there. And I understand that people have their homes or what have you in America or like they're, they're renting or what have you. But I didn't have that when I was uh, filming over in Europe and in Asia. I, I'm, I'm a pretty minimalist guy. I have a pretty lean film setup and everything. And so, yeah, when I'm in Europe, when I'm in Asia, I'm I'm crashing at people's places for the most part uh, in exchange sometimes for cooking for them or, you know, sometimes I'll do like small little advertising. Like, uh, for example, I was in Indonesia in Bali and there was this uh, one like little house that... Uh, needed some marketing material, some video marketing material. And I said, sure, I'll, I'm happy to do that. And they let me stay. And so it all kind of like, it all boils down to frugality and resourcefulness. Uh, I will say, yes, I, I also have done a bit of fundraising. Uh, I had a pretty successful Kickstarter after I filmed my first season, Taste with Europe. And, um, you know, I think I'm still in that process of figuring out the long-term financial path for taste because I've, I've been able to get it to a point where I can sustainably do it myself by myself. And, uh, but as you know, Tammy, like film is a, is a team sport, right? Yeah. And I didn't get in, yeah, exactly. Hopefully. And I didn't get into this to be a, a one man band. I did this out of necessity. Like my end goal is to create a series that kind of like marries the cinematic beauty of say BBC's planet earth with the journalistic, journalistic integrity and doggedness of say like 60 minutes or uh, New York times is the weekly all telling the most amazing stories of the people who make our food from around the world. And so that's why I came to New York is to build out that team. Like this city more than my old home in Los Angeles uh, in my opinion, uh, is like the home for nonfiction storytelling. And I know that, and this is such a global city, um, that there'll be people here who, you know, are, are crazy enough to join me, this crazy guy, uh, in making this, uh, I hope. And so that's, that's why, like, I'm, I'm looking especially for a business development partner to help build out the commercial side of taste where we make branded content for companies, uh, which will help fund our original films that we can, uh, you know, do with, you know, a, a fairly small and nimble team. I, you know, I just saw the movie, the creator, which is a big epic film made by, you know, the director who made rogue one. Uh, but he, in order to pull that off, he filmed in real world locations and he filmed with a very small skeleton crew. And I think that's just the future of filmmaking. That's just how it's going to be. We're going to have to make bigger and bigger projects with smaller and smaller crews. Um, and that's just the reality going forward. No, I think that that's so true. And and sometimes you really don't need a big crew, especially with what you're doing. I don't think warrants that. And sometimes I think people can overcrew. <laughs> their thing when they don't really need that many people and i was just thinking um so go ahead. sorry to cut in yeah i you that's another nail you hit on the head tammy uh like no, having a small crew has been one of the biggest blessings in many way uh many ways because i've been able to get the access and the intimacy that i would not have been able to get if i shoved multiple cameras in a person's face with big bright, intimidating lights and everything. It would just fall flat. Uh, yeah. And I was just thinking, um, you were talking about like doing promos for people, like as you're traveling and stuff like, okay, well, I'll do a promo for you, some advertisement. And it made me think of another guest that I had on who said, yeah, I used to travel. And then I go to the hotels and say, hey, I have a drone. Do you want me to do some drone shots for you so I could stay at your, your hotel? I think it's really thinking outside the box. It's really 
figuring out the way and not letting fear because that's what a lot of us do is we're I don't have the money I'm uh, that's scary and we don't take the leap so you know I just want to commend you for one having the courage to do it two taking the leap and doing it and you know three look at how many shows you've had so far and and growing so and all the people and stories and experiences and tastes you've had that a lot of people have never even gotten out of their town so I just want to commend you for that and I was just thinking with that uh do you have any you were saying that you've almost died twice like can you tell us some crazy stories on this venture sure um I'll tell you like the shorter version of the first time that I was nearly killed. Uh, uh, so as I mentioned, I was in Europe uh, studying abroad and kind of like doing a little pre-production then. And uh, so I'm half Polish. So I was taking, I had a Eurorail pass and um, I was going uh, overnight to uh, Krakow. On, on, on the train and I realized that Auschwitz was on the way kind of thought okay I, I'll, I'll stop over there and I, I'll pay my respects and um, then I'll hop on the train again and head over to Krakow and so I arrived to Auschwitz station which is the city of near where Auschwitz was uh, is is located uh, and I arrived there before the break of dawn it was pitch black dark I get there uh, and I realized I don't have any uh, Pol Polish lotus. I don't have any local money. And so I go outside the train station and like a big shining beam of light is like hovering over this ATM. Everything else is pitch dark. I go up to that ATM and I start withdrawing money. And then this guy comes up to me about six foot something, bushy, kind of overbearing. He comes up and he says, in English... Do you need any help? And I don't know. It's like five or four thirty in the morning. I'm like, and I'm in an ATM. I'm like, eh, no, no, thanks. And so he walks away. Uh, so I go back into the train station. I get a few Z's, and then um, I wake up, and it's about like six thirty-seven. Um, and so I start heading out to try and find Auschwitz. I hear that it's walkable distance from the train station. Uh, if you remember from like, say, uh, Schindler's List, there was, you know, a train that went into Auschwitz. So it's part of the, like the rail line area. Here I am. I've got my, my big back, like suitcase backpack on my back and like my regular backpack on my, on my front. So I, I definitely look like a backpacking tourist. And so I'm wandering around trying to figure things out. And all of a sudden I see this guy, six foot tall, bushy, a bit overbearing. And, uh, uh, and to this day, I don't, I have no idea whether he's the same guy. I, I'll, I'll never know. Uh, but he asks, do you need any help? And I go, yes, I'm looking for Auschwitz. Uh, do you know where I can find it? Uh, he's like, yes, yes, of course. Uh, I, I, I used to be a tour guide. And so we, you know, swap stories. I tell him about California. I tell him like, hey, I give him my phone number. If you ever come to California, I'd love to show you around. I used to be a culinary tour guide. Uh, so I love cool. giving tours all the time. And so they finally get to Auschwitz too. Um, the Nazis were so heinous that they actually had to open up a second camp. That's the bigger camp. That's the one that's featured in Schindler's List. And we were the only people there. And it was quite frightening, eerie, and beautiful at the same time. Remember, it's like the beginning of the day. The sun is piercing through this misty fog that's lifting off from the grass and the the watchtowers are casting this long shadow over the, the lawns and it's just eerie. And so we start walking around and I give him, uh, he, like he, he kind of like tells me some things about Auschwitz and, uh, pretty soon he says, Hey, why don't you, why don't we take some pictures? Uh, and so I take out my camera and then he has me start posing and he says like, why don't you smile? And I'm like, in the back of my head, I'm like, I don't know if I, this is appropriate smiling here at this location. But, you know, he's being so nice to show me around. And we kind of like develop this uh, relationship where I give him a camera, he takes a picture, and he gives it back. Eventually he says, you know, there's another Auschwitz camp across town. Uh, why don't we check that out as well? And 
So we head over there. But then before we get there, he's like, there's this great river nearby. It's beautiful. If you if you see uh, this river and we take pictures, you're going to show it back to your friends back home and they're going to be so jealous. We get there. By the way, this is like in the middle of, I think, like fall or something like that. It's pretty cold. Uh, and it's like, I mean, it's it's, it's it's an okay river, but it's like this brown sludgy kind of place with like, you know, little litter and uh, the trees are pretty barren and everything. Uh, but I humor him a bit and he asks to take my picture a few more times. And as he takes my picture, bear in mind, like the edge of the river has this kind of like small, very small, like a couple inches cliff from like where the 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 bed of the like the land is to then where the river is flowing. Are you there's no like feeling any kind of like are you feeling fine at this point? Like, okay, this is just the way it is. Or is there anything coming up for for you going, this is kind of weird? Uh, great question. No, I'm not feeling weird. You're very trusting. and <laughs> I'm a very trusting person. Yeah. Yes. I, which has been a huge benefit to me in most of my life. Yeah. Yes. I feel like if people are... If you're uh, not a trusting person, then you are uh, cheating yourself. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, yeah. But ultimately, I mean, you know, kind of like the, the punchline to this story, and the, the, the trusting has bitten me in the butt a few times. So, uh, yes, he's kind of inching towards me, uh, getting closer and closer, snap, closer and closer, snap, take a picture. And then pretty soon I'm kind of like, I'm leaning up against this tree that's kind of like jutting out over the edge of the lands that that's going over the river. And I kind of reposition, re reposition myself on the tree. And then all of a sudden I feel a thud against my chest. It's his foot. He kicks me in the chest and I immediately like knee jerk reaction, pull him his leg and I pull him. Like we both go down into the water. Thankfully the river is not super, super deep. It's like up to chest level for me, uh, like up to belly level for him. Uh, but we're like tossing and tumbling a little bit. I, I used to be a competitive swimmer, so I, I like know how to like keep my cool underwater and stuff like that. Eventually, he starts like dunking my head. Like he wraps his arm around my neck and starts dunking my head under the water. Bear in mind, I wear glasses uh, normally and um, my glasses were clean off my face and at the bottom of the river. Um, and hence it was pretty pathetic. Like he, I could tell he didn't want to like kill me or anything like that. Uh, what did he but, want? What was he going after then? He wanted my camera and that's he it? wanted my stuff. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know this until later, but yes, he wanted my camera. Like, so long story short, he gets out then I get out and then like he yells at me saying like, Where's my shoe? Because I, I pulled off his shoe and it floated down the river. I was like, it's in the river. What are you talking about? He's like, and I asked, where's my camera? He said, I threw in the river. You threw off, you took off my shoe. I threw the, I also threw your camera in the river because you took off my shoe. <laughs> and I was like, this is ridiculous. And so uh, I let him go. I walk up and miraculously like i have my computer i have my money i have my passport in my bag or anything all that kind of stuff um yeah so i got i have all that i go up to the side of the road i see a guy putting up a billboard i i say police he doesn't really understand me but he knows what i mean police come over i get in their car we go around the neighborhood and miraculously he's just walking down the street wearing a new set of clothes like a dry set of clothes wow they put him into the car we get to the uh police station they're kind enough to hire a local um a local english teacher from their school to translate my my uh deposition is that what it's called deposition uh and um Pretty soon they find out that he hid my camera. So I actually have those. I have those pictures. Oh my god! Took me at Auschwitz and at the river, still on my on my hard drives. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the times. Well, that's good. I, you know what came up for me? I'm sorry for the experience. I but a good story is that I would be like, oh my god, all my meat is gone. 
that's like the worst, you know, like yes. everything's on your camera. And if it gets stolen, I had, I went on a trip. I took all these pictures. I came back. I left it in the Uber, like Uber car that took me. They, they said they had it, but then they didn't some, how it disappeared. And I was thinking I should have taken the memory stick out and stuck it in my pocket, but I didn't. But you know, it's just like, oh my God, I would have, that would have been a bummer. So thank God he didn't throw your camera in the water. He just yeah. dropped it. Yeah. Actually, yes. And that's a good point. Like I mentioned when I was film when I was in Cambodia with Brian and we went with a bunch of mysterious military men to the pitch dark jungle to shoot a bazooka. There was a moment that I was fearing for my life. Like I had like I had already had that pulling moment. So I had a I was a little bit wiser about trusting everybody. And so I did actually consider about swallowing my SD card. Oh, wow. And like, that's another very important logistical uh, tip for for your filmmaking uh, listeners is backups, backups, backups. Like, I cannot, you're talking to a person who owns dozens and dozens and dozens of hard drives um, and they're geolocated across multiple states. And so like, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, your the the cost of buying a hard drive is way less than your sanity. So, what's your process like when you're filming? The footage can be big, so that's kind of hard to put it into the cloud. It would take forever and stuff. So, do you just like do you bring a couple hard drives? Like, what's your gear that you take to these shoots? Yeah, uh, that is a good point about up to the cloud. Like, actually. Um, so back in 2020, we were part, and we still are part of Google Cloud Platform for Startups program. We got part of this program that basically allowed us unlimited storage space on Google Cloud Platform, which is great. But as you said, like when I'm in some place, like when I'm in the middle of the heart of Borneo, <laughs> there ain't no Wi-Fi. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my gear looks like I've got my camera, uh, I normally have, well, right now I have a Sony A7S Mark II. So a mirrorless 4K camera, uh, but very small, uh, very small profile. I mean, it looks like a still camera, and it is a still camera. Um, so I have that. I have a monopod, which also uh, like doubles as my like um, intimidation stick. Uh, like it's pretty, like it's a pretty heavy duty Manfrotto monopod that. Uh, if anyone wanted to F with me, I could uh, take a nice whack at them. Um, I've got a tripod, like a, a, a Manfrotto um, kind of like, it's called Be Free mon, uh, tripod that's meant for like traveling light. I've got a shotgun mic by um, by Rode. I've got a lavalier mic by Sennheiser. Um, I've got a couple of lens or a number of lenses, a few primes, uh, one zoom, um, like one's a 2470. That's my primary go-to, um, uh, uh, zoom lens and, um, a bunch of batteries. Um, and then, yeah, it's hard drives in my computer and that's pretty much it. And so every day after the shoot, you're backing it up, you're downloading Absolutely. it and then duplicating it <laughs> yes yes and not only that but i'm also i have this software and i highly recommend everybody uh who's a filmmaker who ingests a lot of media uh or just ingests a lot of media period uh get this app i, I use mac so i don't know if this is available for pcs but i think it is name angler 3 it's like a few dollars but i rename all of my files because you're talking to somebody who has hundreds of thousands of files over many, many decades. And so I rename my files and I'll, I'll like rename it with the, sh the shoe location and the date. And that's how I'm able to really keep organized and find all my, all my footage. Wow. That's great. And then, um, what is the device that you're recording your audio to? Are you doing it to the camera or do you have an external, uh, recorder? I have both. So yeah, as, as backup. So I have I'm doing it. Uh, the shotgun mic is connected directly to my A7S II, and then I have my Zoom H6 that I uh, connect with my um, lav mics. They're the best. They are the best. Yes, they are. 
Um, and then your one man band has that increased at all over the seventy episodes, or you're still doing it by yourself? It has increased, like on certain um, projects, I'll have somebody help edit something. Um, for the most part, I'm still like a one man band when it comes to on location shooting. Um, like if I've had some shoots locally in like the Bay area, the San Francisco Bay area or New York city, uh, sometimes I will have somebody with me, but yeah, I, and I'm looking to change that. Uh, I'll say, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'm look, if you're in New York city and you're listening to this and you feel like this is some kind of like cool project that you might want to get involved with, hit me up. Um, uh, because yeah, I don't want to be a one man band forever. And I think this journey should be shared. Yeah. Just like just like Into the Wild. I don't know if you've ever seen that yes. movie. Yes. Yeah. I was just thinking because as you were sharing about just your trip to Poland and here you are with this huge backpack. That's the worst part about, I think, traveling, um, you know, cross country is you have to carry everything. <laughs> it's not like yeah. you get to drop it off at the hotel. You're carrying it to the next place and, and you have to pack so much stuff. But also I was just thinking how you're kind of by, you're kind of by yourself. You are by yourself. I know you will go and you'll see people, but I'm sure there are long spans of no one, you know, like you don't know anybody and that can feel, does it ever feel lonely? Like when you're out there or do you like a lot of alone time? So it doesn't really bother you. Oh boy, Tammy. What a question. What a question. And I'm glad you're going there. Essentially, I've come to terms with the fact that if you're going to take the unbeaten path, then it is going to be a lonely journey, uh, like just implied. Um, I will say that, like, for example, I I haven't had a romantic relationship in a very long time. A very long time. That's another reason why I came, I came to New York. And so, yes, it does get lonely. I think I have a very unique personality in the fact that I can be very gregarious and I, I'm, I, I'm, I really like being around people. I mean, that's why another reason why I came to New York and why I live in the location that I do in New York. I'm, I'm like, I'm in Greenwich Village and I'm in the middle of pretty much like all walks of life. Um, unavoidable and I love that aspect but I can also be kind of monastic I've I've learned to cultivate that side of myself as well I can be very introspective I think there's a reason why I'm not like a youtuber or blogger and I'm more of a filmmaker because I like that reflectiveness I like that uh, um, poignancy and thoughtfulness and care uh, that can only come through, you know, meditation and reflection and, and spending a long time, sometimes alone with your thoughts. That's essentially what writing is, uh, is it not? So, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but uh, yes, it can be lonely at times. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a lot of courage, I think, to be with yourself. I think a lot of people don't spend any time with themselves. And I think there's something to you are going to learn and transform yourself through these experiences. And anytime you push yourself outside of your comfort zone, you know, and then really the resilience of knowing that I can go anywhere and I'm going to be okay. So I think that's really great. Thank you. Thanks. I hope so. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. I can tell by just the fact that you're saying that, that I'm sure that you face that as well. Yeah, yeah. I love my alone time. <laughs> I like to reflect like to. and stuff. I do too. I do too. It, it's all it's all balance and it is necessary. It really is. Yeah. But I also like you. I mean, I do that's why I love this podcast is because I get to meet people all over the world. I get to hear their story and I get to be a part of their life for an hour. You know, and and maybe if I'm really lucky, I might get to have more time with them after that, you know, and become friends. Yeah. So I think it's really yeah. powerful, the story of people. And I feel everyone, I don't care if you're a beginner or, you know, at the end of your life, you 
everyone has a story. Everyone has something to offer. And it's just uh, giving the space of that time to, you know, find it and, and being curious, being curious. And, and, and with what you do, you have to be curious. You have to figure out the questions. So um, how do you come up with the questions? Do you have, you know, a set of questions or do you just kind of fill your way on creating them based on the person? Yeah, yeah. that's a good question. question. <laughs> <laughs> Very meta. Um, yeah, I uh, creating questions is lots of time what I, I spend a lot of time on. It, it all stems from research and really getting to know the person inside and out, seeing just scouring the internet and possibly sometimes print media uh, and uh, seeing what they're about and their why. Why do they do what they do? That's the most important thing to me. If there's any um, kind of like baseline question, that is it. Because uh, whys lead to stories. Um so and then then followed by hows and the whats and the whens and the wheres. I, I'm mostly interested in how they've taken a risk or how they're living their most authentic self by doing what they're doing. What I mean by that authentic self is, and this is this is purely from my own lens and my experience, uh, because. I am a product of, you know, a, a Polish father with Jewish ancestry, but he had to, their, my ancestors had to give up their Jewish ancestry as refugees to come over to become adoptees for a Catholic family. Um, an Asian mother who my ancestors were one of the first Asian families in an all white town during the Chinese Exclusion Act era. And like the, you know, the local judge tried to run him out of town. Barbers refused to cut their hair and they had to open up an American restaurant in order to, you know, survive and, and make money. And once per week, they would uh, serve Chinese, like Americanized Chinese food, like chop suey and chow mein in order to, um, you know, kind of introduce the Chinese culture to the locals. Uh, and slowly they got accepted into, you know, society. And then, you know, having a, a brother who is trans and, like, I feel like our uh, our media is slowly catching up to where we are as society. Like, finally, we're seeing stories that champion, you know, black voices and Asian voices and Latino voices. We're, we're more complex than just that. And I think authenticity is more than just the color of your skin. I think it's more than just your identity or your religion or, or what have you. We are all... What I, I love about what you just said about interviewing people around the world and hearing their extraordinary stories, I believe that everyone has an extraordinary story. There, there is no ordinary person. There is no ordinary life. Okay. We might have, uh, you know, certain paths or, or jobs or something like that, or career paths that might be uh, more common than others. But that doesn't mean that the, you know, that person who ended up being an accountant that <laughs> took my, that I was more than willing to let go and have them, they might be like an amazing pianist. They might do like volunteer at a soup kitchen or like be incredibly vulnerable or like be going through something that nobody else in the world is going through. And so uh, I think that uh, to answer your question, question, I like to get down to the root of who they are as their authentic self. I don't want this to be a, a commercial for their restaurant. I don't want this to be a thing where, oh, I am a black chef or, oh, I am a Chinese chef or a, a, a like that identity doesn't only just define them. There's, there's more to it than just their belief system, their race, their nationality, et cetera. Uh, and so I'm, I'm here to find out what parts of their past and parts of their upbringing, the parts of their heritage uh, and parts of their food manifest into who they are authentically. Yeah. It's always interesting. Um, what leads you to where you are? Like what choices do you make for career? 
um, or family or why you stay or why you go or, you know, all these things. But you have to be curious and you have to ask the questions and then drilling it down to get the answers because sometimes it takes a little bit to f go deeper, deeper, deeper to, oh my God, what? You play violin at, at every night for your kids? Wow. Like, you know, I wouldn't have thought that, you know, or something like that, you know? Yeah. One of my favorite chefs and friends who who's who's a chef here in in Brooklyn, uh, he makes some kick ass fried chicken. There was actually a like a, a waiting list of thousands uh to to get their for people to get their hands on his fried chicken during COVID. But he was training to be a classical cellist at Juilliard. Oh wow. Before uh, becoming a chef. And, and then eventually he went on to work in fine dining. He worked at 11 Madison Park, which is a Michelin starred restaurant. Um, what an extraordinary life. And now he's making fried chicken. Like, right. who would have thought? I know. You know, it's funny that you should say that because I was working with somebody who's a psychologist and, um, and then he said, yeah, my prior life was a chef. And I would, I would, okay, so you were a chef and then you became a psychologist? I mean, wow, that's a commitment for schooling. Um, but yeah, you just never know. Oh, and uh, I have a guest and, and she was a, she's a set medic on, on set. And then she told me, oh, you know, I'm a award-winning skier. Uh, back in the day, I've three times free, uh, freestyle skiing. What? Yeah. And she said, yeah, I don't really tell a lot of people that. So I think that there's always a story you know, if we just sit and ask, and I think people are more than happy to share when you ask, when you really care, you know, exactly. I think that that's exactly. the bigger thing is really care about what you want. And I love asking questions because I love to know sometimes it's like, I, I don't, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, and another thing and another thing. And, and what else? And, you know, like, because every time you talk, I'm always thinking of like 10 other things I want to know about that. So it's like, sometimes reining it in and giving people a breath to talk. Um, so where can people see Taste? So we have a few sneak preview episodes out online. Uh, you can look up uh, Dictionary of a Food Hero on Amazon Prime. I've got a few, as you mentioned, on uh, YouTube. And I post daily uh, teaser videos on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube uh, and Facebook. But I'm not going to be releasing out the majority of tastes until uh, we're done editing the majority of the, the films that I mentioned. And so that's uh, more of a reason for you to reach out. <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm seriously, I give, there are people in, uh, especially in New York City, especially editors, DPs, or business development folk who uh, might want to get involved, then you'll be help crafting the the where these films will go because that's a whole other discussion i mean i've had 10 years of thinking about distribution and uh like the film industry in general i mean i started this before netflix was even doing a streaming service right when they were just doing dvds and uh, i see the future of distribution being very much uh like event-based where it's more than just streaming like it's some of my best screenings have been not at film festivals and we've been at over 40 film festivals. And by the way, that's another place that you could see some taste films is at film festivals. But I know that that's kind of a privileged place to see things. And so our best events have been actually what we call film to table events where we show some films and then we have, you know, a local chef with local ingredients making a menu inspired by the films that we just watched. We, have a great time with music and, you know, discussion and just amazing food and, and company. And so we're kind of carving the path for a new distribution system, especially after what we've seen with how like these mega streaming conglomerates are kind of screwing over writers and screen actors and other creatives. It's, I, I just don't see it as a very sustainable path. And I'm, I'm also realistic that like, I'm not Scorsese. I'm not big name that can, you know, mandate a huge budget from one of these places. And so I've had to think about getting a little bit more creative with our distribution and we'll possibly be carving a new model that will hopefully empower other filmmakers 
to be like those indie musician artists that are, you know, doing what they love and doing it sustainably. I love that. Yeah. And uh, any last words that you want to share with the viewers? I just want to say thanks for asking such amazing questions, Tammy, and being so thoughtful. Uh, I can just really tell that you you are curious as well. And uh, I guess my last words would be to for everyone to just stay curious and stay hungry for the world around you. And if you're if you're curious about another human being, if you're curious about food, then uh, I think that makes you a better human being. And so I applaud everyone for doing that. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to get out there and make a film. Reach out to your local filmmakers group to get involved and connect. Please subscribe to the show if you like it and follow me on Instagram at Tammy McGarrow. Until we meet again, what's your story?